Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 8i of Useful Genetics. Here we're going to switch gears from using crosses to map genes onto chromosomes to using crosses to find out what genes actually do. We'll carry out a mutant hunt to discover the genes that are needed to synthesize a particular red pigment for a flower. And we'll then use a technique called a complementation test to assign these mutations to different genes. So here's our goal. We want to use genetic analysis to investigate the biochemical pathway that makes a flower pigment. We're going to get mutants that are mutated in different steps in the pathway and find out how their pigments have changed, and then we'll work out the biochemical details. So the first step is to identify the genes that are involved in this pathway. Um, just to refresh your thinking about pathways, here's a drawing of a pathway from Module 4, a very simple pathway. We've got the biochemical components, a precursor molecule that's converted into an intermediate molecule that's converted into our final red pigment. These conversions are carried out by enzymes, which are protein catalysts, and the enzymes in turn are coded for by genes. Enzyme A is coded for by alleles of gene A, our plant is diploid, and enzyme B is coded for by alleles of gene B. Now, you want to carry out a mutant hunt as your first step. Your goal is to create and identify mutations that affect the pathway that synthesizes the pigment. In particular, you want mutations that prevent the pigment to be synth from being synthesized so the flowers are white instead of red. To do this mutant hunt, you start with a true breeding red flowered variety that's been well characterized. True breeding means it's homozygous at the alleles at the loci that matter. And you isolate pollen from this plant and treat it with a mutagen so that there's a lot of changes to the DNA sequence. And the mutagen you use causes frame shifts because you want all of your mutations to be loss of function mutations. Then you screen the plants using a genetic trick that will let you make the plants homozygous because you expect these loss of function mutations to be recessive. And you identify four strains of the plant that are homozygous for mutations that give white flowers. So how many genes does this mean are needed for pigment synthesis? Well, we don't know yet. That's the next step. How can we find out if two mutations are in the same gene? And I'm going to illustrate that using a, um, several identical versions of the pathway that I showed earlier. This pathway has only two genes involved in its steps, but don't assume that our red pigment pathway for our flower has only two genes. So consider first, one of our mutants might have mutations in gene A. Those mutations would prevent synthesis of enzyme A, which would in turn prevent synthesis of both the intermediate and the final product, so the flower would be white. The genotype of the plant, we could just call it little a, little a, little a, but because there might be other mutations in A, I'm going to call it A1. A second mutant might have mutations in gene B. Again, mutations preventing the synthesis of um, enzyme B and preventing synthesis of the red product. The mutant's genotype would be, again, loss of function, recessive mutations in B, but because there might be others, we'll call them B1. And yet a third plant here might have a different mutation in gene A. Again, it would have the same phenotype, no red pigment, but in this case, the mutations would, would be due to A2 mutations. Sorry, the phenotype would be due to A2 mutations. Now, as geneticists, we think of using crosses to um, find out things about genes. So how could you use crosses to learn about the relationships of the mutants to each other? 
Well, that's what this question asks. If two mutations are in the same gene, do you expect a different F1 phenotype than if they're in different genes? And the answer is yes, because you're only going to have a red F1 if the mutations are in different genes. Now, I'll take you through this analysis in case you didn't work it out for yourself when answering this question. And to do that, we have to think about the genotypes of our plants. So one of our plants, we'll say, has the mutation in gene A, its genotype is A1A1. Our second plant has mutations in gene B. Its genotype is B1B1. Now are those the complete genotypes? Well, no, they're not. Because we haven't considered what alleles of gene B does the first plant have and what alleles of gene A does the second plant have. Now we started with a homozygous wild type plant that could make red pigment. So we expect that this plant should have functional alleles, big B alleles of gene B. Similarly, we expect that this plant should have functional alleles, big A alleles of gene A. So before I draw the gamete genotypes, I want to ask you one more question. Which mating square is appropriate for illustrating this mating? And the answer is none of these mating squares are appropriate for illustrating this mating. They're all much too complicated. Because our plants are homozygous, A, A1, sorry, A1, a1, B1, B1, B, B, they're only going to produce one kind of gametes. This plant is going to produce, let's see, B1, just to keep my colors straight, A1, A. They're only going to produce one kind of gamete. So our mating square is just going to have one box in it. And our offspring are going to be big A, a little a1, big B, little b1. I'll leave you to work out the um, comparable analysis for a situation where the strains have mutations in the same gene for yourself. Here's the results of all the pairwise crosses. Now, on the top, we have the pollen source, pollen from plant one, plant two, plant three, plant four. On the, going down the side, we have the recipient plant. When you do a cross between plants, you take pollen from one plant and put it onto the flowers of another plant. Down the center here, we have our control crosses. I'm going to write a little c beside each of these. These are crosses where we took pollen from plant one and we put it onto a recipient plant one. So these plants were selfed. And we expect, in all cases, that when the plants are selfed, the flowers will be white, just like the parent plant was. This serves as a control to make sure we're not contaminating our pollen with pollen from other plants. Now, if we look at the other plants, the other boxes represent other crosses. Um, on the one side, we have a set of crosses, and on the other diagonal, we have basically the identical, the reciprocal set of crosses, with them switching roles, being the pollen plant or the recipient plant. So we can just look at one half. And what we see is that all of the combinations, one with two, one with four, two with three, two with four, three with four, are all red. But the combination 1 with 3 is white. So now I have two more questions for you. First, how many different genes are mutated in these four strains? And the answer is three different genes are mutated. And we know this because 
for all but one of the combinations, we get red flowers. But then when we combine gamete from recipient one with a gamete from recipient three, whether we do it this way or whether we do it this way, we get white flowers. And that tells us one and three are mutant in the same gene. Two and four are mutant in other genes. Now, one more question. How many genes must be in the pathway that makes the red pigment? Well, just because we found three mutants, three mutations in three genes, doesn't mean we found mutations in all the genes. Our mutant hunt tells us that there must be at least three genes but it doesn't tell us that there's only three genes. It could be that if we'd isolated more mutants, five or six or 10 or 20, we would have found more genes. We don't know yet. We have to do a more exhaustive mutant hunt. So what we've done is quite a bit. We've carried out a mutant hunt and we've used a complementation test, doing all the pairwise crosses of a set of homozygous recessive mutants when the mutants all have the same defective phenotype. And it's a complementation test because when we get restoration of the wild type phenotype, it's because each mutant carried wild type alleles of the gene that was defective in the other mutant. If we don't see complementation, that tells us that the two strains between them have only defective copies of the genes, of the gene. Now, coming up next, we're going to use pedigrees to investigate family inheritance. Pedigrees are a lot of fun. I hope to see you there.